Support for this podcast and the following message come from Money Mind from Prudential, a podcast powered by your financial behavior. Hear insights from financial psychologists, experts, and more. Download and subscribe to Money Mind wherever you find podcasts and learn more at slate.com slash money mind. Hey, podcast listeners, it's Ophira. Now we've got only two more shows at the Bell House in 2016, so you don't want to miss out. On November 14th, we've got Dennis Quaid, Carrie Elwes, and Christian Cook from the Crackle series, The Art of More. And on December 12th, we're joined by fashion guru, Tim Gunn. Info at amatickets.org. Hey, take Ask Me Another and more with you with the NPR One app. NPR One finds you the best from public radio and beyond. Election essentials, local stories, and your favorite podcasts. NPR One is ready to make driving, working, or cleaning the house so much better. Find NPR O-N-E in your app store now. From NPR and WNYC, coming to you from the Bell House in beautiful Brooklyn, New York, it's NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia, Ask Me Another. Now here's your host, Ophira Eisenberg. Thank you, Jonathan Colton. We have a great show for you. Eight contestants are here to play our nerdy games, but only one will win our grand prize, provided by our special guest... He's a stand-up comic, former Daily Show correspondent, and his latest comedy album is titled Furry Dumb Fighter. Our VIP is Wyatt Sinek. Also, we are going to talk about Fashion Week, but don't think New York or Paris. Think Pakistan or the Gaza Strip, because joining us for our Meet the Expert segment from the Viceland TV series States of Undress, we have Haley Gates. Let's start things off with our first two contestants. Emily Crow, you are a middle school science teacher. Yes, I am. And you once taught uh, recently in Cutter? Yes, I did. Now, is that, were there any different activities that you did with the uh, school children out there? Um, not really. It was just a very different kind of school than a school that you would find in the South Bronx. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In very what difference? S- in what sense? Just as far as the students that are there and the things that you do and where everyone goes on spring break and d- different things like that. It's very, very different. So, Elise Fisher, you're getting your EDD in education. Now, you also taught Yiddish on a Native American reservation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I was the library media specialist on an Indian reservation for a few years. And any time they didn't have anything to talk about, they would say, Elise, teach the kids some Yiddish. Because the sounds were the same in the tribal language, Kurisan, as they were in Yiddish. So really? I would teach them kvetch. Yeah. And the other Anglo teachers would be like, kowetch. They couldn't get that KV. And the kids would be like, I'm kvetching up a storm, Ms. Fisher. <laughs> hey. Or Schwitz, Schwitz, which yeah, I'm sweats. doing right now. Sure. So this is good because you both work in education. So I feel like uh, this is a good matchup because our first game is called Discourses Pass Fail. Jonathan Colton and I will read clues in a stereotypical Brooklyn accent. Ah. <laughs> and the answer to each clue is a word starting with dis. Clever. Jonathan, can you give us an example? I would love to. If I said... You may have a different opinion, but there's something about that perfume smell I really like. I don't know if that's a Brooklyn accent or not. I'm not sure. (laughs) You would answer, descent, which is how someone with a Brooklyn accent might say, this scent. Yeah. Right? There's a few things out there you can still make fun of, and this is one of them. So every answer will be a word beginning with dis, and when you remove the dis, you have what sounds like another word. Here we go. He can't practice law anymore, but this beer pub he opened is awesome. Elise. Disbod. Spell your word. D-I-S-B-A-R. Yes, exactly! Your Brooklyn accent was too authentic. I had to double check. (laughs) It is confusing. It's a confusing accent. (laughs) I was cleaning my apartment and throwing away stuff, 
Sorry, I got rid of that birthday note you bought me at the Hallmark store. <laughs> Elise. Discard. Discard is correct. I'm distressed. How could you also schedule your wedding in the same month as Mother's Day? I know the acting throws people off. <laughs> Emily. Dismay. Dismay is perfect. This museum has a great exhibit of props and costumes from Death of a Salesman on Broadway. <laughs> Should we go to our puzzle guru, Art Chung, for a hint? Death of a Salesman is a type of what? Emily. Display. That's right. Display. I found something new last night. It's a great band, but they only play other people's songs. You should hear them do Born to Run. Emily. Discover. That's right, yeah. Discover. They also do This Is How We Do It. <laughs> uh, Sweet dreams are made of this. <laughs> I can't believe how gross this is. I hate it when there's a sudden burst of wind. <laughs> Elise. Disgust. Disgust is correct. It cost me an arm and a leg, but I finally got to join my local country club. Elise. Dismember. Yeah, you got it. This is your last clue. <laughs> I know you feel let down. We'll reschedule your dentist visit for another time. Let down and reschedule your dentist visit. Or haircut. Or... Emily. Disappointment. Disappointment is correct, yeah. All right. Puzzle Guru Archung, how did our contestants do? They did equally amazing, so here's a tiebreaker. I got a reduced price on my hotel room for my trip to Transylvania. Only problem, I got a bunk with Dracula. Emily. Discount. That's correct, congratulations. We're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. Let's meet our next two contestants. Katie Pollack, you were once chased by a lion. Yes, I was. Can you tell us about that, please? <laughs> <laughs> I was on safari in East Africa with an Academy Award-nominated actress. Named? Can't tell you. Rhymes uh, with? Rhymes with? Still won't tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> and but she didn't win. She, she has not won, to my knowledge. All right, I got it. But uh, we were on a horseback riding safari, and a lion came out from behind a bush and chased us. And our safari leader uh, had a bull whip like Indiana Jones and chased it off with the whip. And then I wish she had a gun. So that yeah. was a surprise. Now, did it go through your mind that you were like, ah, oh, no one will let this woman die because she's famous? Yeah. In retrospect, I was probably like higher on the list of ones they would sacrifice. Yes. Erin <laughs> Bach, you are an Eagle Scout? That is correct. So once an Eagle Scout, always an Eagle Scout? Yes, that's true. All right, so you must know, what should you do if you're chased by a lion? Uh, outrun your friends. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Smart answer. You guys get to play one of our favorite games called This, That, or The Other. I'm going to give you a word or a phrase, and you just have to tell me what category it belongs to. And today's categories are facial hair, Craft beer or type of chicken? <laughs> okay, so buzz in to answer. And if you're wrong, your opponent can steal. Here we go. Balbo. <laughs> Katie. Facial hair? That is facial hair, correct. <laughs> yes. Barnavelder. <laughs> Katie. Craft beer. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. What is it, Aaron? Uh, it's got to be a craft beer. Uh, facial hair. <laughs> it sounds so, so much. It should be a craft beer. 
But I'm going to go facial hair. You're going to go with facial hair. It is a chicken. (laughs) Yeah, it's a chicken. Uh, Supposedly it's a chicken that is bred as friendly and talkative. Talkative? Yeah. I didn't didn't know that. That doesn't seem like a quality you'd want in a chicken. (laughs) No, it doesn't seem like you'd want to make sure to end that species immediately. (laughs) Pipe down, chicken. (laughs) Kelpie. Aaron. Craft beer. You are correct. That is a craft beer. Yeah. <laughs> Old Dutch. Katie. Chicken. I'm sorry. That is incorrect. Aaron, what do you think? Is that facial hair? Yes, facial hair. You are correct. That is what we're looking for. It is that uh, Old Dutch. is that Amish beard with just the sideburns with the long, long beard. Mm-hmm. Why? Why is that a, something anyone would do, Jonathan Colton? It's a good, I don't know. Some people like that look. It's not for me. I, I think you need the mustache to break up the face. <laughs> is that what it is? It's to visually break Breaks up the up lines? The face. Otherwise, it's too much face in one place. <laughs> I didn't, I've never seen it that way, but now I get it. Uh, Mangora. <laughs> Aaron. I'll try chicken. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is incorrect. Mangora, Katie, what do you think? Oh, a beer. It's a beer? Craft beer? Too bad. No, it is facial hair. Yeah, it's a portmanteau of man and Angora, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Is that like the beard that goes from your back, like a sweater into a bed? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's a face sweater on a man. (laughs) Um, No, it's actually a close cropped full beard like what John Hamm is known for sporting. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Something you just want to snuggle up in, I guess. <laughs> I like Katie's idea of a beard that connects to the back hair. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. I'm glad I'm entertaining you. Yeah. <laughs> Butt face. <laughs> Is that facial hair, <laughs> chicken, or craft beer? Katie. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That is one ugly chicken. Uh, no, that is not a chicken. Aaron, can you steal? I really hope it's a craft beer, because that would be terrible if it's facial hair. <laughs> you hope correct. It is a craft beer, yes. Naked neck. Don't think too hard, guys. You just got to pick one. <laughs> Aaron. Uh, facial hair. <laughs> that you would think we would go that way. <laughs> But you are incorrect. <laughs> Katie, can you steal? Craft beer. It's a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> the Transylvanian naked neck. Art, how did our contestants do? They did okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, slightly worse than chance, but congratulations to Aaron. You're moving on to the final round. Thank you. Coming up, we'll talk to Vice Lens Haley Gates about how fashion empowers people around the world, and we'll settle some pop culture battles with comedian Wyatt Cenac. I'm Ophira Eisenberg, and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from iBooks with A Clash of Kings, Enhanced Edition by George R.R. Martin, which contains interactive maps, author notes, illustrations, and much more bonus content that makes this epic story come to life. So whether you're a diehard fan who's fluent in Dothraki or a reader who's just digging into the series for the first time, A Clash of Kings, Enhanced Edition, takes you on a thrilling adventure. It's available exclusively on iBooks books at apple.co slash Game of Thrones. Not available in all countries. Just a quick shout out to our sponsor who brings you this message, Zip Recruiter. They understand that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all of the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Right now, Ask Me and other listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash another.
This is Ask Me Another, NPR's hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia. I'm your host, Ophira Eisenberg, here with puzzle guru Art Chung and our house musician, Jonathan Colton. <laughs> our next game is about musical instruments, and we have two overqualified contestants joining us. Andy Roninson, you are a composer and musical director. Yeah. And you work in musical theater, but you're also part of a legend that is deals with art yeah. and musical theater. Can you share this legend? Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if this is true. Okay. But as a Fair. story goes in my family, uh, I had a great, great, great something grandfather who uh, was in this small village in Belarus, and he was a teamster, meaning that he would have a cart and a horse, and they would move stuff around. And he would like to get drunk after work and sing to his horse. And... In this small little village in Belarus, there was this little boy who remembered this and grew up to become a painter in Paris and painted these stained glass windows. That painter was Marc Chagall. And he was so inspired by this thought of this guy and this singing to his horse that he painted this giant man playing violin on top of a house. So in this legend, I'm related to the actual original Fiddler on the Roof. Wow! Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Tim Monahan, you are an elementary school music teacher. Yes. Do you know, Tim, that you are standing beside someone who's related to Fiddler on the Roof? At this point, I do. I know. This is intense competition. Tim, what is your favorite obscure instrument? I'm not sure what the cultural name is, but they are giant logs that are pitched. This is, it's from somewhere in Southeast Asia. And how many log players are there per... Six to ten. Log band? Yes. Nearly six to ten? Southeast Asian pitched log band. Okay, I like it. <laughs> There's really nothing like it. I can't, I, I feel like you're right. <laughs> Andy, what's your favorite obscure instrument? I'm going to go with the banjo lele, which is... Oh, that a, sounds a, terrible. It's a, it's a combination <laughs> of a banjo and a ukulele, so like a tiny little banjo. <laughs> Oof. Best of both worlds. Yeah. So your game is called Not About That Bass, and here to play it on an instrument that is not a bass, Jonathan Colton. Thank you, Ophira. We all know that Megan Trainer is all about that bass, but we here at Ask Me Another are not so narrow-minded. We've rewritten the song to be all about other musical instruments. All you have to do is buzz in and identify which instrument I'm singing about. However, you must sing your answer in the style of the chorus. I'm all about that bass. You know how it goes, right? Okay. Replacing mm, bass, of yep. course, with the mm. correct instrument. If you say bass, you'll be wrong. <laughs> the winner will move on to the final round at the end of the show. Are you ready? Yep. Here we go. Yeah, I'm blowing air to a wooden tube. Wearing this awesome kilt, playing loud sounds for you. I got that drone, drone that all the Scots chase. Amazing grace in all the right places. Andy. All about those bagpipes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, my mama, she told me I'm tone deaf and shouldn't sing. This instrument's easy, just hit it and make it ding. It's in the flick of a wrist where my musical skill resides. Metal and shiny and simple with just three sides. I'm all. Tim, you're a little excited. I'm all about that triangle, yeah, that triangle, that right. triangle. That's correct. I'm bringing bluegrass back. Go ahead and pluck the five strings really fast. I play it too, I guess you think you're fast Well, just like in Deliverance, we're gonna have a duel Andy, cause I'm all about that banjo <laughs> That's right He was intimately connected to half of that answer I know, he was ready to, he had that all loaded up and ready to go Because of his great love of the banjo <laughs> Finally came in handy I love a uplifting clue that mentions deliverance. Yes. <laughs> I always think about that banjo scene. That's right. A little uh, joke line there. Deliverance. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm going to wake you up by playing Reveille. I don't got no valves. Cold brass is all I need. You 
know you'll find me putting through the paces, playing lots of songs on military bases. Andy. Because I'm all about that bugle. That's right. I like a soccer match, but it's just way too soft. I want that constant hum that's gonna pump you up. Give me that plastic cone, I'll blow it till I drop. Every moment of the game, you will be begging me to stop. <laughs> Andy. All about that Vuvuzela. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody actually is all about the Vuvuzela. No, no, no. It's Sorry. a good supporting instrument. They're... You don't want to be all about it, though. <laughs> Art Chung, how did our contestants do? They got them all right, and congratulations to Andy. You're moving on to the final round at the end of the show. It's time for Meet the Expert. Our guest is a writer, producer, and host of the television series States of Undress on Viceland, where she covers fashion weeks in some pretty unlikely places around the world. Please welcome Haley Gates. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Because I know you are traveling all the time. You are covering fashion weeks in unlikely places. And by unlikely, we mean the Gaza Strip, Pakistan, Venezuela, the Republic of Congo, Russia, China. Now, are these fashion weeks like emulating American fashion weeks or are they something totally different? Um, it sort of depends on the place, but I, I will say there seems to be a kind of fashion week model, you yeah. know, and so there are a lot of familiar aspects to to the fashion weeks around the world. But yeah, I think in some ways it's sort of a marker of stability in otherwise unstable regions to host a fashion week. Right. It's like when a, a Starbucks moves into a neighborhood, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. But Time on a to way... move out. <laughs> Time to move out. And how do you find that fashion uh, empowers people? I mean, especially when you're going to, some, you know, Pakistan or, or Palestine. It's interesting. I mean, I've definitely had to learn a lot about religious clothing. Right. I bought my first burqa. And you wore it. I wore it, indeed, yeah. I met with a hardline Islamic cleric named Abdul Ghazi, who's the head of the Red Mosque in Islamabad, who has ties to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, <laughs> um, to ask him about sort of his ruling on what women are allowed to wear and what their place is. All standard burqas are made of polyester, <laughs> which is very breathable, a cruel <laughs> right. and unusual punishment <laughs> right. when, you, when you're sitting in the Osama bin Laden Memorial Library. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, so it's been interesting. But when you see sort of the restrictions that are placed on certain groups of women in these places, and then you, you see this Fashion Week, it's kind of a beacon of hope. Fashion Weeks tend to be kind of places of refuge for outsiders. And that's true everywhere, I think. And where are you off to next? What's next on the agenda? What new uh, unlikely places? Well, I'm trying to get into Iran at the moment. Yeah, how's that going? <laughs> Not very well. No. <laughs> All right, yeah. well, we're going to have to get you there. <laughs> you can fly on the NPR plane. Thank you. The NPR private jet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's funded through pledge drives. Yeah. <laughs> Free granola. <laughs> so, Haley, are you up for an Ask Me Another Challenge? I am. All right. Am. So we were inspired by your travels in fashion. We wanted to write a quiz about something that you, you know, you are talking about all the time on your travels. So we went with famous women who have transformed fashion. Okay. And if you do well enough, get this, you will receive a limited edition Ask me another Rubik's Cube. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Here we go. A lifelong vegetarian, what fashion designer does not use fur, leather, or feathers in any of her clothes and started the Meat Free Mondays campaign with her father? Stella McCartney. Yes! Well done. Thank you. 
you are witnessing all kinds of designers that I'm sure I've never heard of, yeah. innovative local designers. Has anyone stuck out that you're like, this person is going to be an international star? This is kind of a spoiler, but I did try on Rihanna's Met Gala gown. Ooh, yeah. Yeah? The one with all the pizza memes. Oh, God. It's a giant golden gown that is completely fur-lined. It yeah. also has bright pink lining on the inside, which is kind of funny because it <laughs> looks like a mouth <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know, when you open it up, it's like a little, it feels a little intimate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, like you're showing the insides. Yeah. It's back in China. I went to Guo Pei's studio and it took like six people <laughs> to carry it and place it on my body. She also had no idea who Rihanna was. Yeah. The designer had no idea <laughs> yeah. who Rihanna was. Yeah. She was like, somebody told me it was a big deal. <laughs> uh, back to your quiz. Okay. One unlikely fashion trend in recent years has been the balaclava, a wool knit ski mask that, that has been worn by everyone from Beyonce to Cara Delevingne. What punk band wears the balaclava as a sign of political protest to hide their identities? Pussy Riot. Yes. Again, you are correct. <laughs> What supermodel was the subject of a nude portrait by British artist Lucien Freud, which sold at an auction in 2005 for 3.9 million pounds? Kate Moss. Yes! Wow, cool. Yeah. When you're traveling to all these different places and you're packing, and yeah. obviously there's different, you know, you're dealing with, right, as we were talking yeah. about, modesty yeah. issues, yeah. weather issues. Is there yeah. one thing that you're like, well, at least I can bring this? Uh, chili flakes. <laughs> okay. You bring chili yeah, flakes with I you? I bring ever? chili flakes everywhere, yeah. <laughs> I just like spicy food, and it's not, like, it's popular in some places, but huh. not everywhere. Um, yeah, it's actually funny, though, because when I did pack for Pakistan, it was my first trip, and I packed all of these clothes that were, like, <laughs> you know, my most conservative clothes, Sure. and I showed up at the Fashion Week, and they were, like, they thought I was the most poorly dressed school marm <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> they were all wearing, like, glitter dresses and high heels, and I was, like, <laughs> and they thought I was a librarian. Oh, that's hilarious. And I was, like... Um, you know, I'm like kind of cool. Like some people think I'm cool. <laughs> and they're they like, sure. <laughs> they thought they constantly were trying to dress me in the designer's clothing because they were so disappointed by the way that I looked. They thought NPR sent a journalist to cover fashion exactly. week. Exactly. <laughs> All right, here's your last question. Now in her 70s, legendary designer Betsy Johnson still closes out her fashion shows by doing what down the runway? The splits. Yes, the splits and occasionally a, a car, car wheel. wheel. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In her 70s. It's amazing. Haley, we are going to give you an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. States of Undress premieres on Viceland on March 30th. Let's hear it one more time for Haley Gate. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Haley. so fun. Are you all dressed up with nowhere to go? Why not be your contestant on the Ask Me Another stage? Get started by filling out a contestant quiz at amatickets.org. <laughs> Let's meet our next two contestants. Dave Cummings, you're a new dad. Congratulations. Thank you. So uh, as a new dad, how much are you paying to be here right now? Well, there are two sets of babysitters. Yeah. And uh, I can't tell you the last time I've been out in public with grown-ups talking about grown-up things. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We have a wonderful contestant opponent for you. Caroline Alwick, you work in public relations. I do, yeah. How would you do in a horror movie? Uh, I'm a woman, so I would die. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, you're really, you're really bringing me down talking like that. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan Gold. Horror movie, romance, we die in everything, don't we? That's pretty much the brace. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Well, horror movies are designed to scare the pants off of you, but we think the real world is scary enough. So we have rewritten the plots of horror movies by removing all of the horror elements 
to make them happy and fuzzy for all the softies out there. So we'll give you a non-scary version of a horror movie, and you buzz in and tell us the name of the original film. You ready? Yep. I'm ready. Okay, here we go. With the support of her gym teacher, an introverted teen reconciles with her strict religious mother, becomes popular, and is crowned prom queen. At the end, all of her friends dump a bucket of red Gatorade on her. Dave. Carrie. Yes, indeed. A high school student calls up Drew Barrymore and asks her some fun movie trivia questions. <laughs> If she gets enough right, she wins a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Caroline. I actually don't know this one. Um, oh, good thing you buzzed. Yeah, I just wanted to get in there. Uh, I know what you did last summer. No, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. Oh. You know what it is, Dave? Scream. Scream. You got it. <laughs> the trivia is coming from inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, a tricycle-riding clown puppet, entertains two men playing a diabolically hard room escape game inspired by their own lives as part of a team-building exercise. Dave. Saw. Yes, you are correct. Seven young people board an airplane, but one of them gets a premonition. They'll get upgraded to first class... Wi-Fi will work the entire flight and they'll land early. It all comes true. Then later they die of natural causes. Dave. Final destination? You got it. Right, that should be the horror movie. Economy class, group six. <laughs> Four unpopular girls become friends and never turn on each other. Then they form a coven and use their collective magical powers to help those in need and do good deeds. Dave. The craft. Exactly. <laughs> Three student filmmakers go into the woods to film a documentary. <laughs> Somebody gasped. Scary. I know. <laughs> documentary in the hands of students is know, very frightening. <laughs> don't let them do it. <laughs> Three student filmmakers go into the woods to film a documentary, but decide to scrap the project when they realize the footage is too shaky. <laughs> Dave. Blair Witch Project. That's right. All right, this is your last clue. A haunted video cassette tape will kill you in seven days after you watch it, but thankfully, no one has a VCR. <laughs> Caroline. The Ring. The Ring is correct. Let's go to our puzzle guru, Art Chung. How did our contestants do? Sorry, Caroline. Dave is a little bit faster on the buzzer. So congratulations, Dave. You're moving on to the final round. Coming up, our VIP, White Sinek, will reveal the answer to the age-old question, who will win in a fight, Batman or Superman? I'm Ophira Eisberg, and you're listening to Ask Me Another from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Discover. The traditional first anniversary gift is paper. Now, most couples aren't gifting each other stationery, but Discover is following this anniversary tradition for its new card members. At the end of your first year, Discover will match all the cash back you earned dollar for dollar. No caps and no catch. That's a paper anniversary gift in the form of a cash back bonus. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Cashback match offer only for new card members. Limitations apply. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Ask Me Another, and you should check out the Car Talk podcast with Click and Clack. They offer car advice, tips, troubleshooting, and occasionally answers to car questions. And in between the laughter and the snorts, well, the Taffer Brothers have you covered. So laugh along anytime to the Car Talk podcast. Find Car Talk now on the NPR One app and at npr.org slash podcasts. This is NPR's Ask Me Another. I'm your host, Ophira Eisenberg, here with house musician Jonathan Colton and puzzle guru Art Chung. 
Now, please welcome our next guest. He's a comedian and former Daily Show correspondent. His new stand-up album is called Furry Dumb Fighter. It's Wyatt Cynic. <laughs> Oh, thank you. One of your first jobs was as an intern at Saturday Night Live, and supposedly you got that job by writing a bunch of letters? That is true. Until they couldn't refuse you. I think they still could have refused me. (laughs) I think they were just being environmental and didn't want me to keep wasting college paper. (laughs) I didn't go in with the intention of getting an internship. I was 19 years old and didn't necessarily know how television worked. And so I figured you could just write somebody a letter and say, Hey, Lauren Michaels, I'd really like to be a cast member on your show. Is that what your letter said? I think that was the first one, yeah. (laughs) And then I, I included some sketches. I was like, I can write as well, so I'd like to be a performer and a writer. Here's some sketches. Uh, you know, I don't have any video, but just trust I'm good. <laughs> and then uh, they sent the letter back. So and they, they sent se- the letter back. Yeah, because it had sketches in it. They don't want to take submissions, and so that was what the response letter was. Was it said we can't take submissions? And in my 19-year-old brain, I was like, can't or won't. <laughs> and so I figured I'd send it again. <laughs> And after about six times, uh, I started negotiating with against myself, where it was like, "Look, I obviously I think I would make a great cast member, great cast member slash writer. I'm also open to an internship." (laughs) That's amazing! You made it happen. Yeah, yeah, by being a weirdo. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Because here's the thing, if somebody sent me six letters, I'd call the cops. <laughs> now, you have a brand new comedy album out, uh, Furry Dumb Fighter. Your previous comedy album, Brooklyn, uh, was nominated for a Grammy. Yes. Now, <laughs> what I specifically love about that whole thing is that the album was... Uh, filmed and recorded at Union Hall, which is a very small venue. It seats like around 100 people. Yes. So was that a choice that you made specifically, that you wanted a small venue? Yeah. I was producing it myself, and so I don't have money to rent out (laughs) Madison Square Garden. (laughs) Right. And this album, your current album, where did you decide to record that? This one I recorded at a comedy club in Madison, Wisconsin, called uh, Comedy Club on State, which uh, is a very cool club, very nice people. And it was a weird thing because when I was doing a show a year ago in Madison, the night I was doing my show, Dave Chappelle happened to be performing right across a town square. Ugh. And so it was one of those where I got worried that nobody was going to go to my show because we were literally across a town square from each other where it felt like if anybody didn't know that Dave Chappelle was in town as they were walking to my venue, (laughs) they would see the marquee and be like, oh, we made a mistake. Right, right. (laughs) How did it end up going, though? It was great. People came out. My show was sold out and... uh, Dave's show was sold out. I don't think he was as worried as I was. <laughs> and then I went and did a spot on his show, and so it was fun. So it was, uh, oh, yeah. well, yeah. That's the, so you got to do the best of both worlds. Yeah, I got, to, I got to do both shows. And again, and I was like, if you want to do mine, he was like, I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. So you've released two albums on vinyl. Yes. And as a comic who is now thinking about their album on vinyl, are you thinking about what's on the A side and what's on the B side? For sure. Uh, When I did it with Brooklyn, when I recorded it, I had a thought in my head of where the break would be, and I was wrong. (laughs) Yeah, it's good that you decided that, yeah. But on the record, it does reflect that. Like, it reflects how wrong I am, and... (laughs) Because I kind of call it out, like, oh, this is where the record's going to flip, and then it doesn't flip. (laughs) Nice. Now, I also hear you really like puppets, and I don't mean this to sound weird. Yeah, when you say it like that, that feels feels creepy. Uh, But you 
enjoy puppets. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say it. How about this? You don't come across as someone that likes puppets, but I hear you're a puppet liker. Why don't... (laughs) Why don't I seem like I would like puppets, Sophia? (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Because you don't seem whimsical. Have you seen this hair? This is whimsy. (laughs) This is a cotton candy machine that broke. What kind of puppets are your favorite kind of puppets? <laughs> I mean, like finger puppets, marionettes. I enjoy a good string down marionette. Do you? Yeah. Do you have the puppet of yourself? I do. I have a puppet of myself. When I worked at The Daily Show, uh, we had some puppets made of myself, John Oliver, and John Stewart. And when I left the show, I stole the puppet. (laughs) I'm not not even going to say I stole it. I took what was rightfully mine. (laughs) And where does this puppet live? In a box. Okay. That's not a thing that you can keep in your apartment. It's weird. Yeah, that's weird. I just have it on my couch and (laughs) people come by and it's like, oh, you don't want to talk to me? Well, how about me? (laughs) I've seen how you judged me for saying I like puppets. How weird would it be if you came to my house and, yeah, it was just like, oh, yeah, hold on, let me slip into something more comfortable. <laughs> hey there, everybody. Are you thirsty? Let me go to the bar. <laughs> you are a man of numerous talents, clearly. Why it's in everybody. I appreciate everybody. that you didn't say many. <laughs> Too many to count. We would like to put you in an Ask Me Another Challenge. Are you up for that? No. Okay. All right. Thank Show's you over, everybody. so much. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. We know that you are a huge fan of comic books, animated shows, puppets, all kinds of stuff. So we are going to put you in a classic geek game called Who Would Win in a Fight? All we're gonna, right. Yeah, we're going to give you two characters. Could be comic book superheroes, animated sitcom characters, real people, whatever. You have to decide who our audience said would win in a fight. All Let's right. start with the classic, Superman versus Batman. I know what I would say. I think the audience would say Superman, because he doesn't actually have to step into the ring. He could just be like a thousand feet away and use his eye beams and just blow up Batman's head. Right. And so. And what would you say? I would say Batman only because Superman is a very nice man. He, so I feel like Batman could play to his niceness and just and then when he's not looking, slap him with some kryptonite. <laughs> so our audience was very split. 54% said Superman. Yep, so you got that right. Nice. 46, though, said Batman. And reasons, good reasons. People pick Superman. Major reason is that people said red underwear makes you confident. Oh, and I'm the weirdo. (laughs) All right, this is a Sesame Street brawl. Bert versus Ernie. Ernie. Ernie? Yeah. The only way Bert wins is if Ernie gets on Bert's nerves so much that he just has, like, a psychotic break. Actually, 53% of our crowd picked Bert. You're wrong. You're wrong. They yeah, said, thank you, person who went, oh, really loudly. You're, I'm playing for you. All right, this one, I think, is the most important matchup. Voldemort versus Oprah. First thing I'm going to say, have you ever seen Oprah and Voldemort in the same place? (laughs) First off, we're talking about a real person versus a fictional character. So if we're just going there, I think Oprah closes the book and throws it away. And it's just like, I win. (laughs) So in that regard, I would have to go with Oprah. They did. 63% went with Oprah. 
But they didn't go down the lane of like she is real and Voldemort is. They said Oprah is generous and would give everyone magic wands. Would she also give them training? Because that's you don't just give people magic wands and hope for the best. They, that's going to be a problem in itself. This is your final one. Chewbacca versus five Ewoks stacked on top of each other, wearing a large trench coat. I'm gonna go Chewbacca because I was never a fan of Ewoks, <laughs> and I think five Ewoks standing on top of each other—that's very tall. Like、mm-hmm. that's like an Ewok was like four feet, like three and a half to four feet. So you're talking about like a 15-foot. <laughs> That's gonna fall apart. That thirty walk is gonna fart, and then this thing is gonna come tumbling down like a game of Jenga. They said Chewbacca. Sixty-one percent said Chewbacca. Wyatt, you have won and asked me another Rubik's cube. Did I? You <laughs> did. All right. You <laughs> did. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's hear it one more time for Wyatt Sinek. Thank you, everybody. I can't hold you down if you want to fly. Can't you see I'm all broke up inside? We'll just use your two X-ray eyes. It's really super, super, girl. How you saved yourself in seconds flat? And your friends are gonna say that's really super, super, girl. How you're changing all the world's weather, but you couldn't put us back together. Now I feel like I'm tethered deep inside your fortress of solitude. Don't mean to be rude, but I don't feel super, super girl. Jonathan Colton. Now we are going to crown this week's big winner. Let's bring back Aaron, Emily, Andy, and Dave. They'll be playing our final round, and let's turn it over to Puzzle Guru Art Chung. This final round is called the Produce Section. Each answer will contain an item that you might find in your supermarket's produce section. For example, if I said this satirical newspaper's motto is Latin for "You are dumb," you would answer the onion. We're gonna play the spelling bee style, so one wrong answer and you're out. You only have a few seconds to give me that answer. The last person standing is our big winner. Your prize is an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube and an autographed copy of Wyatt Cenac's Grammy-nominated album Brooklyn on vinyl. Here we go, Emily. This movie review website describes its highly rated films as certified fresh. Tomatoes. What's the full name of the website? Rotten Tomatoes. That is correct. Aaron, this band simultaneously had number one and number two hits on Billboard with "Boom Boom Pow" and "I've Got a Feeling." The Black Eyed Peas. That is right. <laughs> Andy, it's a nickname for the shape of the smoke that follows a nuclear explosion. Mushroom cloud. You got it. <laughs> Dave. In 1987, this iconic toy turned in its pipe and became the spokesbud for the Surgeon General's anti-smoking campaign. Mr. Potato Head. That's right. <laughs> Emily, one theory claims that this popular soft drink was named for its inventor's father-in-law, a Texas physician. Avocado. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Let's go to Aaron. Dr. Pepper. That is correct. I'm sorry, Emily. Thank you for playing. Andy, roll doll book featuring talking bugs and fruit.、Uh, BFG. Nope. Dave, what's the answer? James and the Giant Peach. That is correct. We say goodbye to Andy. We're down to Aaron and Dave. Aaron, he's a red-headed prop comedian. Carrot top. That's correct. 
Dave, this racket sport played on a four-walled court was named for the softness of its ball. Squash. That is right. Aaron, Bullet with Butterfly Wings and 1979 are two hits from this Billy Corgan-fronted band. The Smashing Pumpkins. That's right. Dave, this 1986 film features Prince as a gigolo. Under the Cherry Moon? <laughs> you, you said as a question, but that is correct. Wow. Aaron, this British company makes tiny credit card sized computers. Raspberry Pi. Wow, you got it. <laughs> One more. Dave, it's the fictional band on the Nickelodeon show Doug. The Lemons? No, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Aaron, if you know the answer, you'll be our grand prize winner. The Cantaloupes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, the answer was The Beats. Let's go to a tiebreaker. You can cut the tension in the room with a knife. Yeah! Wow. This is why they play the game, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, you ran through our questions, so we're going to a tiebreaker. It's a cellular phone with a built-in keyboard that was popular among business types in the early 2000s. Dave. Blackberry. That is correct. Congratulations. <laughs> Dave, your chain of babysitters has paid off. I know. They're going to be so pleased. Thank you to Emma Rose, my beautiful daughter. Oh. oh. And that is our show. Thank you so much for playing. Check out our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. And you can find us on Facebook or Twitter at NPR Ask Me Another. Come see us live or be a contestant. Just go to amatickets.org. Ask Me Another's puzzle guru is Art Chung. Hey, my name anagrams to Narc Thug. Our house musician is Jonathan Colton. Thou Jolta Cannon. Our puzzles were written by Annabelle Bacon, Eric Feinstein, Scott Ross, and senior writer Kyle Beakley. Ask Me Another's produced by Keanu Fitzgerald, Mike Katzif, Travis Larchuk, Julia Melfi, Denny Shin, and our intern Alejandra Vasquez, along with Anya Grunman. We are recorded by Bill Moss, Noriko Okabe, and David Hurtgen. Ask Me Another was created by Eric Newsom and Jesse Baker. We'd like to thank our home in Brooklyn, New York, The Bell House. Hot Heel Blues. And our production partner, WNYC. I'm her ripe begonias. Ophira Eisenberg. And this was Ask Me Another from NPR. Hey, it's Ophira Eisenberg here. Now, I know if you made it to this point in the podcast, you are a fan of our show. Thank you so much. So, why don't you do us a favor and rate us on iTunes? Or better yet, leave us a review. Your support helps other people find our podcast. Thank you. Next time on Ask Me Another, we're at the Majestic Theater in Dallas, Texas, where everything is bigger. Special guest Brooklyn Decker tells us what it's like acting with Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin in the Netflix series Grace and Frankie. And then she plays a game of two truths and a lie, boy band edition. So join me, Ophira Eisenberg, for NPR's Hour of Puzzles.